All right, uh, begin a little bit early here. Hopefully my audio is coming through. It is the the current week. Can you believe that? A lot of a lot of shit happening. So I just kind of wanted to do a stream. I was going to do a video today, but it seems like every time I'd start it, some new political fucking shitstorm would start, and trying to play catch up was just getting to be impossible. This last uh, week to two weeks has been hectic to say the least, with everything that's been going on in the White House and the Senate with the mainstream media. It's just been this never-ending avalanche of complete and utter bullshit. So I figured a stream would be better equipped to deal with that than a, a straightforward video. That and there's other shit to talk about, too. Some gaming stuff, a little bit about uh, Shia and a recent uh, meltdown he had in a bowling alley. I think, he's, I think he's finally starting to crack. I think that pressure has finally built up enough to drive him, you know, certifiably insane. So hopefully... Hopefully we get to see him go on a killing spree eventually, if the pressure is kept up. I don't know. No promises. You never know what's going to happen. But Shia, I think, is starting to lose his fucking mind. Let me just uh, double-check audio and we'll, we'll get going here. Okay, I think, we're, I think we are good got a little list of topics. I actually organized it this time, so I don't go rambling about shit and then forget what I wanted to talk about. Try to hit them as, hit them as bullet points. But um, uh, initially, I, w I wanted to do a video talking about, uh, obviously, Rice, uh, the unmasking that was going on with the Obama wiretapping allegation. But now we've got, uh, what is it, Nunes stepping down. We've had all sorts of crazy shit going on with Bannon getting kind of ousted, or it's being claimed that he's being ousted. Kushner, um, with all the stuff that's going on with Gary Cohn and Dina Habib Powell. Uh, it, it's just, it, it's been insane. So there's there's a lot of shit going on. Uh, today, uh, I know that the Supreme Court nomination got pushed uh, through. The Senate uh, fuck, uh, fucked around, tinkered with some of the rules there about a majority to be able to do an up and down vote to block a filibuster. I know the Democrats were Slightly ass pain about that, but from what I understand, they did this back in 2013. Granted, it wasn't about the Supreme Court, but it was a uh, a little technique they used. So if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. But uh, I really wanted to focus on Bannon, I think, because I think that's kind of the interesting thing. I've been reading a lot about it, and I know that there's some divided opinions about what's going on with the Trump White House and the, uh, I, I guess, the advisors or the circle that Trump is keeping around himself right now. You know, people have concerns. Is he, is he being swayed over to a more globalist position, or is this just 14th dimensional underwater uh, chess that he's mastering and he's puppeteering the mainstream media and all the people that are against him? And this is some amazing strategy that's coming out. But there, there's a lot going on. Uh, so Bannon uh, is lost the position that he had on the National Security Council, but he's still an advisor to the president. Now, there are two takes on this from what I've been reading uh, and from what people have been talking about. Some are saying that he was kicked off. Others are saying that he was only on there for a certain amount of time to basically deal with uh, what you would call deep state elements that are, that would be, I guess, a detriment to Trump's administration. So, you know, where does that go? You know, was he thrown off? Uh, did he actually threaten to quit? Because I know there have been a couple stories that said that he had... Uh, made some statements about basically resigning. Now, from I, the way I look at it is this. It's a, a position of power that he had that he doesn't have anymore. And I don't know too many people that would willingly give up a position of power unless they either had a goal that they've met or they were ousted. So I, I, I can see why there are two divergent viewpoints on this. I don't know, chat. What, what are you thinking? Because I can't, I can't wrap my head around it. I don't understand what's going on with Trump right now. You know, I'm seeing a lot of weird shit happening, and it's really hard to kind of peg down exactly what's going on. Uh, we've got the situation with Syria. So there, there's a chemical attack. There are all these images of kids. Where, you know, were kids hit in this chemical attack? Oh, my God, this is terrible. We need to deal with uh, Assad. We need to go in there and uh, take him out. And yet, you know, people are, are sending out tweets saying that journalists in the region were talking about the attack before the attack actually happened. There have been pictures of some of the kids, uh, videos of some of the kids, that look like they're actually moving around, that maybe they're not dead and they're just propped up as a piece of propaganda to try to sway Western opinion. I, I don't know. It just it seems like a lot of shit is hitting 
pretty quickly after one another. I know Tillerson is talking about a military option. I know Trump is thinking about it. We've had comments about we need to go in and deal with this. It, it, it just seems counter to what he would have said in the position that he had a month ago, a week ago. And it comes right on the heels of what's going on with Bannon and potentially being outed. Uh, and Kushner, who's seemingly bringing in these people, like I said, like Gary Cohn or Dina Powell, uh, to, to positions of power or to an advisory role that has the ear of the president. It's really bizarre. Trump works in mysterious ways. Uh, somebody said, I think Steve Bannon is a faggot. Syria attack done by the rebels. False flag. Yeah, I, I've heard that too. And listen, you know, when it comes to attacks in the Middle East, especially when it's in regards to Syria, we had something like this happen before, where there was a lot of evidence that they were planning a false attack, where there was a lot of evidence where they'd stage injuries or deaths to make it look like uh, Assad's regime had done it to garner sympathy. And so just, I, I don't know, man. It's just some weird shit's going on in relation to the Trump White House and to his foreign policies, uh, and, you know, sp specifically about military intervention and about the National Security Council, and who's on it, and who has influence in the White House. And it seems like they might be interconnected. It seems like there's some kind of a... that something is happening right now. But I can't really put my finger on it. People saying, what the fuck, I hate Trump now. I, 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 I don't know. Maybe we're all just... You know what, guys? Maybe we're all just really sleepy. Maybe we need to take a nap. You know, maybe a good night's rest will do it. What do you say? Our almonds have been activated too much. Let's... Let's just go get some shut-eye. What do you say? Forget about all this stuff. I'm really... I'm really tired. Right? 1488 D-Chess. Well, that's one way of looking at it. And then we had the story come out today, and I know it's the Daily Beast, but the Daily Beast talking about how uh, Jared Kushner and Steve Bannon are not, uh, are not bosom buddies. That Steve Bannon apparently refers to Kushner as a cuck, and a globalist, which I think would be fantastic. I, I'm trying to imagine that conversation happening in the White House, where you've got a guy who's an advisor to the president who's on the National Security Council telling, uh, telling Kushner, telling, uh, <laughs> calling him a cuck and a globalist. Uh, it, it's, God, it's almost, it's, it's kind of like imagining Alex Jones running around there and just being able to say that kind of shit. You know what I mean? Just, just imagining them going at each other. Uh, it's just, it's a weird division, I guess, between the two. If you have the globalist perspective and then you've got a nationalist perspective, it, you know, it might make sense as to why they want Bannon out or this particular group or this individual or the people around him would want to push Bannon aside. I know that some articles were making comments that Trump was bothered by SNL skits and Trump was bothered by mainstream media coverage talking about Bannon being a shadow president. But I don't know if I would buy that, to be honest with you. Trump was under a barrage during the election, uh, well, in the Republican primaries all the way up until the election, where he was made fun of constantly. Everybody was taking shots at him, but he seemed to stay the course. He didn't. He wasn't throwing people off because he he thought that would make his image look better. So it, it's hard for me to imagine that you know a couple SNL skits are going to be enough to get rid of Steve Bannon, or that he was really bothered by some shitty fucking Saturday Night Live. Uh, 20 minute thing with Baldwin I, I just I can't picture him using that as an excuse to get rid of somebody because he was that thin skinned I, I don't see that as being real you know are Bannon and Kushner are they having arguments in the White House is he calling him a globalist cuck I have no fucking idea I don't know Steve Bannon that well I don't know much of him um, but it, it's, it's just weird to see that he's pulled off his council and then we've got the Syria attack going on now they're talking about military intervention they want to get involved they think Assad's a bad guy it's just that the timing of that is really, really makes you think. Really, really gets the fucking almonds going. It does. It sparks the imagination. Woke the fuck up, Jim. Gotta, gotta stay awake. We got a couple people saying, fuck Drumpf. Yeah. It is the current week. What are you, what are you doing? Let the Syrians kill each other. It's not our fucking problem. I, uh, you know... I don't see why we need to get involved in foreign politics. I don't see why we need to have a military in intervention overseas. I, I get the argument. I've heard this fucking argument before. It's a very tired argument. Well, if we don't go in, then somebody will prop up Assad as an even stronger puppet government of the Russians or 
it, it, it sounds like the same Domino's bullshit that got us sucked into fucking Southeast Asia in the 60s and 70s. I, I don't see that as a great excuse to go over there. What Every time we're told that there's a dictator in a country somewhere in the Middle East or Southeast Asia, we go over there, we get entrenched, we lose a bunch of fucking money, we lose a bunch of personnel, we get rid of whoever's the bad guy, put in incompetent people, and then everything falls to shit in 10 to 20 years. So what was the fucking point of going there in the first place? What did it net us? What was the fucking benefit for us to spend the money and the materials to go over there and actually intervene? Now people say, oh my god, think of the children, think of all the poor victims and all the shit that's going on over there. People suffer all over the world. I don't see these people saying, well, we need to intervene in uh, some shithole in Africa because people are starving. It, it's, it's the news cycle, it's a propaganda that's being put in front of their face with a narrative that makes them want to go over there. So we go over there, we do what we do, what we always do, and then we end up paying the cost for it for two decades? How is that, how is that something that makes me want to do that? How is that a good direction for the country? Uh, people saying this can be linked back to the globalists. <laughs> well, you know, I'd like to take this commercial break to remind you all to buy your water filters because we don't want our frogs turning homosexual. And I know that is on the globalist agenda. You know, speaking of homosexual uh, frogs, isn't Alex Jones in a little bit of trouble? Didn't he make a video, which, by the way, was funny as shit, where he's going off on, was it a senator? Uh, talking about, you know, if you bring that shit in my face, I'm going to slap you around in regards to being called a Russian agent. And now people are saying, oh my god, that crossed the line, it's a felony. He's um, threatening violence on a politician. He can't do that. that. That is not allowed. A lot of, a lot of almonds have been activated in the chat. Uh, half of the chat, though, is talking about nap time. I don't know. Again, God, getting really sleepy. Maybe we should just stop thinking about these things. Just take a rest, a little bit of a nap. You know, just uh, close our eyes for a little while. Let the world slip away. <laughs> let me pull up a couple articles here. Let me let me see what the uh, the word on the street right now about uh, <laughs> about uh, Bannon and Kushner. I'm going to grab. You know, actually, I'm I'm going to throw up the. The Daily Beast article. That's that's a great source. Let's go to the Daily Beast and see what they have to say about it. Let me uh, let me just change my my screen here. We'll we'll read through a couple articles and see if we can if we can get to the truth about what's what's going on today. There we go. Let me full screen this bad boy. <laughs> Steve Bannon calls Jared Kushner a cuck and a globalist behind his back. Donald Trump's two closest aides are fighting nonstop and often face-to-face, -face, officials say, and it's even uglier in private. Donald Trump's chief strategist, Steve Bannon, has called the president's uh, senior advisor and son-in-law, Jared Kushner, a cuck and a globalist during a time of high tension between the two top aides, several Trump administration officials told the Daily Beast. I love how it's always, they never give a source which is always the first sign that what you're reading is completely accurate and true, right? Never get a fucking source for this. They could just be ma you know, pulling it out of their ass, but we'll never know. The fighting between Kushner and Bannon has been nonstop in recent weeks, according to sources who spoke on condition of anonymity. It's been an open secret that Bannon and Kushner often clash face-to-face, -face, according to sh er, senior officials. One official said Bannon has completely, uh, or has lately complained about Kushner's trying to shiv him and push him out of the door and likened him to the fifth column in the White House. I like the prison language. I want you to imagine Steve Bannon up in your face with gold chains and a grill on his teeth with his pants sagging, talking about getting shiv by a motherfucker. Talking about, calling him a cuck and a globalist with his hat to the side, tilted, because he doesn't fuck around. Steve Bannon is street, my niggas. He is as real as real gets. Steve recently vented to us that Jared being a globalist and a cuck, he actually said cuck, as in cuck-servative, the administration official told the Daily Beast. Cuck-servative. Uh, Pantomotu, uh, I can't even say that word. I'm not even going to try to say that word. We're going to just say it's hyperbole. Of cuckold and conservative has become a favorite slur on the right, used like uh, a sexually and racially charged version of rhino. Wow. 
Oh, these people don't get it, do they? Globalist is a term typically used by nationalist pro-Trump right-wingers against political opponents. Really? I, I didn't know the term globalist didn't actually exist until Trump ran for office. That is amazing. Didn't That's a brand new word. Brand new, you know, you learn something new every day. Apparently, globalist came into being the moment Trump said, I want to be president. However, the term has also come under fire uh, for at times carrying anti-Semitic tones. Kushner is Jewish. Uh-oh. Didn't know that. A Jewish globalist. That's like a unicorn, isn't it? Never heard of that before. Bannon is a self-described nationalist and longtime Republican, while Kushner was, until his father-in-law ran for president, a lifelong liberal and Democratic donor. There's a big fight going on, one senior official said. It's all about policy. There's tension between them on trade, health care, immigration, taxes, terrorism, you name it. The White House and uh, the White House and Bannon did not respond to emails seeking comment. Of course, why why would they? The Daily Beast is emailing them saying, "Hey, has anybody called you a cuck while you're in the White House? We're just really we're really curious because this is a story people need to hear. Did did you and Steve Bannon did you get into a little slap fight like a couple of little bitches in the hallway? You know, somebody told us on the condition of anonymity. We need to know." One senior Trump aide said that Bannon was also frustrated with Kushner continuing to bring the Zeke Emanuel to discuss health care options. Uh, the aide said Emanuel had three White House meetings, including one with Trump. That's a little bit worrying. <clears throat> In 2009, conservatives called Emanuel Dr. Death for advocating for end-of-life uh, consultations during the crafting of the Affordable Health Care Act. <sighs> yeah, and he is related to Rahm Emanuel. Well, that's fantastic. Who doesn't want that guy in on this? Steve thinks Jared is worse than a Democrat, basically. Another official close to Bannon said Steve has a very specific vision for what he believes and what he shares ideologically with Trump. And he has, for a long time now, seen Jared as a major obstacle to achieving that. Bannon was removed from his post on the National Security Council on Wednesday. One senior Trump administration official told the Daily Beast on Wednesday morning that Bannon was only on NSC to babysit Michael Flynn because Trump was, lo er, was losing faith in Flynn and that Bannon never went to the meetings. Well, I, I think you get the gist of uh, of what their article is saying. So there's a little bit of a a little bit of a hissy fit in the White House. Not uh, everybody's not playing nicely together. Now I, I could have sworn that I had read an article, uh, maybe it was today or yesterday, talking about Kushner being the one that was, or it was claimed that Kushner was the one feeding anti-Bannon and maybe even some anti-Trump stories to people at MSNBC like Morning Joe. Now, let me see if I can find that article. Again, who fucking, it's mainstream, you know, anything you read in the press these days, you can basically flush down the toilet as far as fucking trust goes. But let's see if I can find that. Ah, oh, there we go. This was up on Breitbart. Okay. This is Roger Stone. Uh, Jared, okay, let me pull this up. Take a look at this. Okay, so Roger Stone, Jared Kushner leaking anti bannon stories to MSNBC's Joe Scarborough. Uh, this came out, yeah, so this was yesterday. Uh, Republican strategist Roger Stone claims that President Trump's son-in-law and senior advisor Jared Kushner is leaking negative stories about White House chief uh, strategist Steve Bannon to Joe Scarborough. Uh, during a segment on InfoWars today, Roger Stone, who was previously an advisor during the early months of the President Trump's campaign, claimed to host Alex Jones that Trump's own son-in-law, Jared Kushner, was leaking information to MSNBC's Joe Scarborough. Jared Kushner, perhaps the one presidential aide who cannot be fired, is now in regular text message communications with Joe, uh, Stone claimed. Many of the anti steve Bannon stories that you see, the themes that you see on the Morning Joe, are being dictated by Kushner. And while Mr. Kushner's plate is very full with Middle Eastern peace and the China visit, and so on, in this case, I think he's div uh, disservicing the president. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, a couple of things. Correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't Roger Stone the one that was saying, and this would have been about a month ago? In fact, let me bring this up, because if I tell you this, you're not going to believe me. So let me find the story first. <laughs> it's so fucking dumb. Okay. Yeah, okay. Here we go. I granted, this is the Daily Mail, but it was the first fucking result I found. And I do remember him tweeting about this, so it's not like they pulled this out of their ass. Uh, okay, let me pull this up. Just to give you an idea, I know some people have opinions on Stone. Some like him, some don't. This is this is always stuck out in my mind as being so fucking bizarre, uh, coming from him in particular. 
Trump loyalist Roger Stone claims he was poisoned with polonium by political enemies who wanted to kill him before he could expose the truth about Russian hacks. Roger Stone claims he was poisoned by political enemies in the deep state. This is from uh, January, by the way. This, this is a couple months ago. He says they wanted to stop him testifying about the Russian hack before Congress. All right, I want to get directly to this because he made a couple of claims that I thought were really weird in, re in regards to this. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, this is this is from him. Yeah, I believe I was poisoned to stop me from exposing the Russian uh, hacking lie before the congressional investigation. He he had said, if I if I recall correctly, that he was poisoned by polonium, a fucking radioactive <laughs> material. And that um, law enforcement and I think people in the CDC were aware of it, but it kind of never went anywhere. Uh, that's kind of a fucking huge deal, and I always found it bizarre that there was really never any fucking follow-up to that. Yeah, this is the results of polonium. This was used on, uh, what was his name, Alexander uh, Litvinenko. Uh, so, I mean, it has been used before to go after somebody, but uh, that's a hell of a claim. A hell of a claim to make, that you're being poisoned by polonium. And does anybody know what happened with that? What what exactly happened with Roger Stone and his fateful encounter with polonium? Does he glow in the dark now? Is he like an alternative fuel source? Do you know if Roger Stone can power lamps by standing next to them? Polonium stone. Yeah, it's polonium stone. I, I, I don't know. I, I think if I were to go, let's say, to the hospital, and they were to say, holy shit, you've been poisoned with polonium. That I, you know, I, I'm fairly certain more than just the police or the CDC would be involved with that. I think you might have counterterrorism show up. I think you might have FBI or NSA show up. You're gonna Homeland Security is probably a given. It's gonna be kind of a big fucking deal if somebody's been poisoned with fucking polonium, because where the fuck did that come from? Did I eat it? Did I drink it? Did somebody inject it into me? Did I sleep on it? Is it my fucking mattress? Is it all over my goddamn house? Maybe we need to quarantine the fucking neighborhood. So, you know, just just some food for thought that, you know, making a claim that you've been poisoned by fucking polonium is a bit strange on Roger Stone's part. And I'd love to hear the follow up to that. Uh, I, I, I can't, I guess, outright dismiss it. It's been used before. But if he's exposing the truth that the Russian hack is bullshit, it's a lie. Why would the poison they're using be polonium, which is something the Russians used on Alexander Litvinenko. You'd think that Putin and the others would be like, that's awesome, Roger, tell them that, uh, and we're not going to use polonium on you. Who, who gets polonium? How the fuck do you get your hands on that? Stone has a huge Nixon tattoo on his back. That is, that is masterful. I, I don't know what's going on with that. I mean, he's wild. I've listened to him before. I mean, he's a funny guy to listen to, but... I always thought that was bizarre. Two months, well, three months ago at this point. This is in January. Uh, three months ago, Stone talking about a polonium poisoning. Uh, in the deep state. I, you know, I didn't even realize it, but he's talking about deep state right here. And I mean, we saw what happened with that over the last couple of months. You had people like uh, Salter Damas, Billy Crystal, come, or Bill Crystal, come out and talk about how great the deep state was and how they're going to take down Trump. And you had other people that were former intelligence community officials talking on social media platforms openly about their connections to deep state as they began to refer to it and how they were going to take down Trump from the inside and they were going to make sure he rots in jail. So, I mean, Stone was, he was ahead of the curve using that term because, fuck, a couple of months later, everybody's talking about it. I mean, you're seeing articles talking about it. But we've gotten off the beaten track. Uh, we, we, we've gotten off the path here. Uh, I got sidetracked because, again, that this story is fucking amazing. Um, okay, yeah, so you, you've got one article... Uh, basically stating that Kushner is what? He, he's giving negative stories about Bannon to the press. And Bannon is essentially, or what seems to be, ousted off the National Security Council. Now, you know, he's not kicked out of the White House. He, he's obviously still an advisor. He's still there doing the role that he was doing. He's just not on this one committee, this one council. But it's an interesting story that's being set up by two different sides. You know, one saying that Bannon was there to do a job, that he wasn't ousted, that this isn't happening. And another side basically stating that Kushner and Bannon are at each other's throats, that there's something going on in the White House, that there's a push for a more globalist perspective. Uh, and then after that, you know, in the last couple of days, what do you have happening almost simultaneously with this? 
Oh, we've got an attack going on. We, we, you know, it's always how fucking convenient. We've got a chemical attack in Syria. And now you've got Tillerson and others talking about, well, we need to go in there and uh, have military intervention. So I don't, I don't know. How the fuck do you keep up with this shit? And what happened with, you know, let's go back to Susan. What happened with her and the unmasking? Let's see if I can pull up an article on this. Because I have no idea what the fuck is going on. Okay, here's one from the Daily Caller. Oh, yeah, people love these fucking daily names. Daily Beast, Daily Caller. <laughs> daily Dose is what they should all fucking call themselves. All right. Here's a more recent Susan Rice. Has given two different answers in the last 15 days on the unmasking of Trump officials. Susan Rice has repeatedly changed her stories over the last 15 days and given two different answers about the unmasking of the Trump transition officials who were caught up in a surveillance of foreign officials. Though Barack Obama's national security advisor at first feigned ignorance, once it was revealed that she was the one who made dozens of requests seeking to unmask the identities of the associates, Rice defended her actions by saying they were the, or I'm sorry, they were for national security reason, or reasons and not politically motivated. I believe that. Why would Susan Rice lie? Clearly. These are for security reasons. First, Rice lectured the president in an op-ed for Washington Post published on the 21st over his claims that Obama administration wiretapped his offices during the presidential campaign. The foundation of the United States' unri or unrivaled global leadership rests only in part on our military might, the strength of our economy and the power of our ideals, Rice wrote. It is also grounded in the perception that the United States is steady, rational, and fact-based. To lead effectively, the United States must maintain respect and trust when a White House deliberately disassembles and seri er, serially contorts the facts, its actions pose a serious risk to America's global leadership among friends and adversaries alike. Uh, now, let me, I'm going to skip ahead and see if I can find this. Okay, yeah, so she was asked on a PBS interview on March 22nd and said, I know nothing about this. I was surprised to see reports from Chairman Nunes on, the, uh, on that count today. Now I'm sure she completely did a one fucking eighty in about a week. Uh, okay, uh, didn't leak. It was in common. Yeah, uh, and then she went on to MSNBC. I want to get the exact quote here. Okay, after reports surfaced that she was the official who requested the unmasking, Rice said her interaction or intentions were not politically motivated. During an interview with Andrea Mitchell on MSNBC Tuesday. The allegation is that somehow the Obama administration officials utilized intelligence for political purposes, and that's absolutely false. There were occasions when I would receive a report in, the U, uh, in which a U.S. person was referred to, name not provided, just a U.S. person, and sometimes in that context in order to understand the importance of that report and assess its significance. It was necessary to find out or request information as to who that U.S. official was. It was not uncommon. It was necessary at times to make those requests. I don't have a particular recollection of doing that more frequently after the election. I leaked nothing to nobody and never have and never would. I didn't do nothing. Unfucking real. So she's telling people, well, this isn't, this is for national security reasons. Clearly, it's not politically motivated. <laughs> I don't remember doing it more uh, for this particular group of people than I did it for everybody else. <clears throat> why should anybody listen to a fucking thing Susan Rice has to say she's already been caught in a lie that didn't even last a week hey, oh, a week and a half tops first she said nothing to do with it doesn't know what anybody's fucking talking about nobody's been wiretapped we're not listening to people or monitoring communications from Trump uh, staffers or uh, anything to do with his campaign or after the election It's that's ridiculous we have no part of that and then a week and a half later Oh, yeah, you know what? I, I do recall. Yeah, it's so so straight. Silly me. I had to take a nap, you know, get a little bit of rest first. But I actually did do that. But it wasn't for political reasons. It's just because I'm a cunt. I am just a massive bitch. So I like to monitor people for fun. It was for fun. It was for laughs. I don't see what everybody is so fucking upset about. <laughs> you can see the crazy shit that's been going on now for a goddamn... Yeah, for the past two weeks. So you put it all together. What do we have? Trump puts out the allegation that Obama is, 
or Obama or people in the Obama administration were wiretapping, basically listening into his conversations for political purposes. Uh, administration officials come out and say that's completely bullshit, not happening, not real. But it turns out it is. Even even Susan Rice turns around a week and a half later and says, yeah, that did happen. Then we have Bannon and Kushner apparently fighting with one another about, I guess, which direction to go as far as the country's concerned, globalist or nationalist. Then Bannon gets ousted. And now we're talking about going to war with Syria because a, a very convenient chemical attack just happened. So it, all this crazy shit in the span of two weeks. And how do you look at that? I, I know there are a lot of people out there that voted for Trump and still have a lot of faith in him, but I know that there's some that are starting to doubt. They're, they're feeling a little bit concerned about what, what might be going on. I think the Syria thing really fucks with them because they look at that like, why would you ever get involved? This is obviously, to them, from their, from their perspective, this is uh, bullshit. We shouldn't be going over there. I don't know, man. It's, uh, it's crazy times. It's just a prank, bro. It is just a prank. Susan Rice is just having a laugh, man. Relax. You know, just fuck it. I just want to listen to your conversations a little bit. Just monitor them. Nothing big. What, what are you getting so upset about? Calm down, man. It's just a prank. Fucking seven months. Are you talking about being monitored? Are you talking about the shit that's going on? Because I would say that if things have gotten more ridiculous the last two weeks than they have in the last couple of months. I mean, it reality broke when Trump won. I don't know how to describe it, really. Shit went off the rails. Uh, you know, it, it's been fucking amazing to watch, but now it's getting really hectic. There's a lot of weird shit kind of happening in a much shorter time frame. Um, but yeah, God. And just, I, I kind of do like, the, I, I, it's it's sick, but I do like the way that politicians are behaving right now. That's why I find it funny that Bannon and Kushner might be calling each other shit in the White House, like yelling at each other and calling each other names. Because I've noticed, and I'm sure you've noticed this too, a lot of people in p positions of, of power, elected officials, talking a lot of shit on social media that's not something we've ever really seen before where they will just call each other out and make fun of each other now on fucking twitter and facebook and youtube it, it's insane but it, it, it's happening it's going to devolve into some giant shit flinging contest on twitter that's how the apocalypse will be triggered it's not going to be some military intervention it's going to be a tweet that went wrong that's that's going to be the start of the fucking third world war what a time to be alive The world is ending. Well, yeah, you know, it was a good run. We got, you know, we got some good, uh, some good uh, video games out of it, I guess. A couple good movies, some fun drugs, but everything good has to end eventually. Do I think there was? Somebody's asking. I do you think there will be a war? A war with who? Who's going to fight that war? Who are the principal aggressors going to be in that war? I I don't know where the fuck things are going to be in five years, or a year from now, or even a month from now. Things are so fucking crazy at this moment. It, 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 things seem unstable. And I'm not, I'm not saying that as in, oh my god, the political people we have in power right now are making it unstable. I mean, it's like reality itself is fucking unstable. And just crazy shit is happening. Um, is there going to be... I have no idea what would trigger a war. We go into Syria and get violent. The Russians push back a little bit. Maybe Turkey loses its fucking shit and does something stupid. Maybe China has a vested interest and gets, it gets involved. I don't know. Maybe maybe a little uh, Kim and North Korea finally launches that nuke and makes it happen and takes out half of Japan. I don't fucking know. Uh, who cares about the wiretapping he won? Uh, well, I would care. I mean, wouldn't you? If, if you were wiretapped by the government illegally, if they're listening, I mean, well, fuck, what am I talking about? We're all being listened to, aren't we? Vault 7 kind of killed any illusion that that's not happening but if you were running for office and you found out the people that were in office before you get there are eavesdropping on you or listening into you and they might be helping your political opponents i'd be pissed about that i'd want a clean house you're not going to want people in a position of power or connected to the government in any way that would get involved in that sort of shit get rid of them if they're going to do that kind of shit fuck off get rid of them fire their ass so I, I could imagine why he would still be interested in that. I could imagine why people would still be interested in that. <laughs> Everything is fine. Go to sleep. Oh, God, yeah, we're all so tired. We all just need to get some rest. 
That, that really is the important thing. All right. Let's, let's switch gears here a little bit. I'll give you a minute to digest that, that, that spew of nonsensical shit. Um, you know, the takeaways from the last half an hour of talking with you should be that Roger Stone is an X-Men now. He's like, he's like a political Wolverine. Right? And he, you know, I'd say like Spider-Man, but he wasn't bitten by a spider. He didn't get bitten by a radioactive spider. He had polonium shoved up his ass. So he's like a fucking superhero right now. Maybe Roger Stone can save the country by using his superpowers and flying to the White House today. I don't know. But that would be the takeaway from this. Let's... <laughs> okay. Um, uh, here's one. This, this, I have no idea what the fuck this is. Uh, I saw this and I thought it was a misprint at first, but apparently it's not. Apparently this is this is on the fucking level. Of course, why wouldn't it be? Why would this not be real? Yeah, I'm just gonna show it to you, uh, and then you could tell. See if see if you can figure out what's wrong with this. It should it should stand out pretty quickly. All right, I'll pull up the monitor here. Here we go. Okay. Bulletstorm, full clip edition. You know this game from 2011 that was kind of meh to begin with? Look at, Take a look at that price. 50 fucking dollars. 50 fucking dollars for a six-year-old game that they didn't add anything to. 50 fucking dollars for a game that they added DRM to, but didn't really boost anything else. 50 dollars for this shit, and it's actually selling. I don't fucking understand how that's possible. Bulletstorm is shit. Yeah, I've had people come in and say, I played Bulletstorm. I liked Bulletstorm. Your taste is shit if you like this video game. It was not that great. It was like, what, four hours long? There was no co-op multiplayer. The online mode was a fucking disaster. And they're bringing this shit over... They're re-releasing it for 50 fucking dollars. And there's nothing, there's nothing new to it. They didn't add anything to it. Oh, it looks a little bit better. Oh, ooh... Oh, it looks a little bit better. That That's worth the fucking price tag. You know, Turok uh, 2 got released on Steam. You know how much they're charging for that? You know, with the upgraded look and the HD graphics and all that shit? 20 bucks. 20 bucks, and that's reasonable for a game that's actually fucking good. But Bulletstorm, for whatever reason, 50 fucking dollars. What a time to be alive. And people are buying it. I, I think it's actually, like, on the second page of bestsellers right now on, on Steam. Pe people are buying this shit. But, but Bulletstorm, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. Yeah, let's go take a look at the community hub. See how many people are praising this pile of shit. Oh, am I adult enough to look? I don't, God, I don't know if I'm adult enough to look at this. It's kind of a big deal. Gearbox is partnering with, oh, I think it's, um, it's whoever sells the keys, resells them. You get fucked over. You can't say the name on Steam. Steam won't, Steam won't let you say the name of this particular company. Is Oh, God, that's right. Yeah, you know what? Actually, this might be worth talking about. They're selling a collector's edition for this pile of crap. Uh, where you get a box they shot. They took a fucking case, a game case, a, a steel case, out to the fucking firing range, put a couple of 9mm bullets into it, and they're selling you that. You know like how those hipster idiots in the 90s went and bought pre-torn jeans? Instead of buying like a pair of Levi's and tearing them themselves, for whatever reason this was a popular style for like a year, instead of buying a pair of Levi's for like 40 bucks and ripping them up yourself, you could go get designer Levi's and have them pre-torn for like 140 bucks instead. That's what this is. You can get a collector's edition of Bulletstorm with bullet holes in it for the for the fucking uh, value of $250. That's a hell of a sale. That's what I want. Oh, thanks for bringing my video game case to the firing range and putting a couple of bullets in it. Really, really shot that price up into the hundreds of dollars. What a fucking farce. Uh oh, uh, what do we got here? I just, <laughs> I, I, beware! A known troll is haunting this forum. Just the FYI, guys, if you want to talk about the hotness that's Bulletstorm, don't go to the forums on Steam. A known troll is hunting, and haunting it, to, simultaneously doing two things. It's amazing. Uh, 
uh, somebody saying, play Serious Sam. Yeah, Serious Sam would be a better fucking game than this. Okay. Yeah, I, I, that's an aside. For some reason, I, I just can't wrap my fucking head around the fact that this game is selling for $50. That's ridiculous. There's no reason a re-release should be selling for near new prices when it doesn't really add anything aside from a few tweaks and maybe a little bit better graphics, maybe higher assets. Because I've seen other games do that, uh, better games do that, for much lower... If this was like a 10 or 20 or $25 purchase, maybe. But 50 bucks is fucking insane. What was the... Uh, oh, here Oh, and then Ukulele. Oh, boy, that's, that's doing well. The reviews for that are out, and people... You know, I'd like to make fun of ukulele, but one of the things I noticed with a lot of the reviews, which make no sense to me when people are bitching about it, these uh, video game websites, they seem to be upset with the notion that the game is a collectathon. So it's like they don't even like the basic premise of what it was. So I don't know if I can really take the review seriously if that's their main complaint. I mean, you should fucking know what it is going into it. So if you're telling me this is a shit game because it is what it said it would be, maybe I'm going to have to discard that. But regardless... The reviews aren't looking so good. 60s to 70s on Metacritic for for the game. I know. I think Jim Sterling gave it a 2 out of 10. I, I don't know why he would do that. I, I can't think of a reason that it would be that bad, I guess. Uh, it looks like it functions. I know that they've, they've said they released an article saying they're going to do a day one patch to fix the camera issues that a lot of people were saying they were having. But uh, it's not looking good. Not looking good for ukulele. And, and the weirdest thing I think about uh, in regards to the game is if you go to Amazon and you look at the uh, store for ukulele, if you look at like the PS4 version or whatever, it says sold out. So I don't know if they printed it in limited quantities or if that's just how games are before. the Like, I, I don't understand what's going there. So maybe it's getting terrible reviews, but so many people pre-ordered it and bought it early that they're going to have a hell of a lot of buyer's remorse when that shit shows up. Or they just, they sent out really, really fucking sparse amounts of the game to be sold digitally or uh, to whatever store would be selling it. I can't fucking imagine what. They don't like video games, Jim. Yeah, I know they don't. I, I know a good portion of video game reviewers don't play or like video games. But I just, I found it a bit absurd that the people that are really banging on it uh, are banging on it for being what it said it was going to be. Like, I, I've seen complaints where they said camera control is shit. Awesome. That that makes, okay, that's a great complaint. I can understand why you wouldn't like that. Talking about certain elements of the game itself, uh, the design-wise, fine. But <laughs> the very core idea of what it said it was going to be, if that's your complaint, maybe you shouldn't be reviewing the game. At two out of ten, I got it. That's a, that is a fucking brutal score. That that two out of ten, that's like fucking uh oh, what's his name, Armin White? Is that the guy on uh, Rotten Tomatoes that likes to go in and basically whatever? Jim Sterling might be like White is on Rotten Tomatoes, where if a group of people are saying one thing, he's going to say the other and be contrarian just because. If you, if you want to see what I'm talking about, go look up his reviews, uh, the the white guy on um, Rotten Tomatoes. Just just look at the scores he's given out in regards to fucking anything, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Ukulele, it functions. 7 out of 10, it functions. I see, I, okay, I see a couple people talking about Scorpio. Let's talk about Scorpio. Digital Foundry, which is, why do I have, that to me is bizarre. I'm not sure why they, why Xbox, why Microsoft would have gone with Digital Foundry to do the reveal of their new system, or the specs of their system. But let me let me pull this up. I'll bring it up on screen. Uh, let's see here. Okay. So what are we looking at for Project Scorpio? Because they just, they told everybody what their new specs are. So let's, let's take a look at this. So we've got eight custom x86 cores clocked at 2.3 gigahertz, which is just 0.2 gigahertz higher than the PS4 Pro. So, and it's not that much of an improvement over the Xbox One. <laughs> I don't know why CPU is always getting... Sh All right, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, GPU, 40 customized compute units at uh, 1.1 gigahertz, uh, compared to 40, er, 36 on PS4 Pro and 12 on Xbox One. 
memory bandwidth 326 gigabytes per second uh, hard drive who gives a shit uh, where was it oh yeah the memory 12 gigs uh, GDDR5 but four of that's held back for the operating system so eight is left for games so when Digital Foundry did their video about this they're talking about the specs and kind of how they put the system together and what they thought it was comparable to and how it worked and the hardware solutions uh, God, what did they, they talked about was a vapor cooling or some crazy shit like that for heat distribution they're like there's no vent on the back it's just on the sides uh, but the other really the interesting thing is they showed not video they didn't show video of anything they showed a screenshot of a Forza game running at native 4k at 60 frames per second only utilizing I think it was like 65 percent of the GPU maybe they have this picture in here do they have this picture in here of course not just going to be this. Oh yeah, here we go. And what we think is a first for mainstream consumer level uh, price of this tech. Scorpio features a vapor chamber cooling system similar to the setup seen on high-end GTX 1080 and GTX 1080 Ti PC graphics cards. So that that is the uh, solution they're going for with this. I w oh yeah, here we go. This is the this is their this is what they're using to con oh, fuck of course your game. Why would you make it legible? What was the okay the uh, <laughs> the usage of the GPU sixty six point one nine percent there there you go Forza Motorsport four K sixty frames per second Xbox One quality settings with four K assets GPU utilization is at sixty six point one nine percent meaning there's a huge amount of overhead left for improving visuals well isn't that just click uh no, that's not gonna work oh, I've got fucking no script on of course that's not gonna work whatever. So those are your basic specs. Now, what what is the price people are talking about? I've seen the number 500 thrown out a lot. E okay, so yes, it is better than the PS4 Pro. It is better than the Xbox One and the base PS4. Obviously, the specs are higher than all of those. And 4K gaming, and it's going to have uh, an Ultra HD Blu-ray player, so you can watch 4K movies, which is something for some reason PS4 Pro decided not to really look at. I don't understand why that is. But I can't be the only one who is a little put off by the idea of I guess mid life cycle moderate to minimum upgrades like I like to see leaps as far as console technology goes you know we have a life cycle for console anywhere from like five to maybe seven years and there's enough space in there to develop some new tech and to kind of come out of the gates and give gamers or at least console owners something to be surprised about but with these almost like piggybacking almost like I don't even know how to really fucking describe it but these this middling jumping of little upgrades well why don't you rebuy your old system that's been tweaked a little bit for brand new prices to play the same old shit like I, what is this going to do for for you as a console owner I, at the price point of 500 600 bucks I have no idea where it's going to fall why not get a mid-range fucking PC if you're going to go that route. I mean, Microsoft is basically putting all their games on the PC anyway for Windows 10. <clears throat> so what's the point of buying their console? The Scorpio, yeah, it's got great... You know, this would have been awesome if this came out four years ago instead of Xbox One. It feels to me like Microsoft is in a really shit position because their idea for what their next console was going to be when they you know, were moving on from the 360 was the wrong fucking idea. It, you remember when this shit was going to launch and they put all their weight behind it? It's going to have, into, what was their, their selling points? TV, 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 right? Oh, you can watch TV from it. Big fucking deal. It's got a Kinect camera that's going to monitor everything you do. When you take a shit, the Kinect is going to follow you into the bathroom. Yeah, people really love that. Online only. Remember that shit? No backwards compatibility. And just really anti-consumer fucking policies. That original you know vision for what the Xbox One was going to be was awful. And so now it feels like this is, I guess, them trying to well they've retooled as they've gone along but this feels like this is them trying to make up for that mistake but it's this half-assed way of doing it i didn't like the ps4 pro what the fuck is that you know oh you're gonna get games that aren't really 4k but are kind of upscaled to it checkerboarding all that with 20 frames per second Ooh, that's fun not 8k no no you're not gonna get 8k with that chat i'm sorry you're fucked <laughs> Some, i'm sorry is there, uh, somebody might have had a stroke in the chat. Somebody actually said Switch is better than both. I yeah, God, you know what I think? What I think I want? Uh, when I think of new new console, new handheld, what I really really want, what I tell people I'm desperate for, 
plastic fucking screens. That is top on my list. When I think high-end new technology, I think I want a fucking shitty plastic screen that gets scratched by a dock that basically is just a plug-in for an HDMI cord with fucking controllers that don't sync up properly to the unit. That's what I want. And one game to play. Only one game to play. Oh, what's that? Indie shit? I love indie shit. Let's uh, make a fucking lineup of games for our console that's nothing but indie shit and one Zelda title. That is, that is what I need. The Switch. Get the fuck out of here with the Switch. What, what do you have to... I mean, it's... What do you got? You got Zelda, right? You're basically PlayStation, right? Instead of Bloodborne, you got Zelda. Consoles are like the new phones now, one every year. It's getting to that point, isn't it? God, that's fucking depressing. <laughs> Does anybody else find it ironic? What was it? Steambox. Uh, you know, Valve wanted to release their own kind of weird PC console hybrid that you could tinker with and upgrade. So you, you'd get it and you could upgrade it as time went on. And consoles now, are, are they trying to copy that? Is that what PlayStation and Xbox are going to do from now on? Are we going to go from, you know, one new console every five to seven years to three or four variations of consoles over the span of that seven years? to upgradable consoles where they're basically PCs? I mean, are the next two generations going to basically take us to where PCs are right now? And that's going to leave what? Nintendo making plastic screen shitty handhelds. What the fuck happened to gaming? The video games are a Jewish trick, are they? Well, they are a successful one because it's making a lot of fucking money. Oh, we're all kings? Well, you know what? Since I see a lot of people talking about what we was, uh, let's talk about what we is. I don't know if uh, all of you are aware of this, but there is a Kickstarter going on right now that I'd like to discuss with you. Uh, shift gears here for a second. I hope you're I hope you're ready for this. Are you all are you cave dwelling Neanderthals ready to get woke? Because here it comes. The Kickstarter to end all Kickstarters. Kids to Kings. Four kids. Seven kingdoms. One legend. Four royal children with superpowers go off on an adventure to prove their ability to rule as kings while undermining powerful gods. <laughs> this has made its goal, by the way. It's got five days to go, and it's it shot past its $4,000 goal. Already made you know nearly $12,000. Let's uh, you know what? Let's let's take a look about this project, part one. I, we're not going to watch the whole full issue. I don't want to. I don't want to. Eighteen minutes. Goddamn. We'll watch a few seconds though. Oh, are you getting woke? Is there no narration? Is this all just fucking text? Oh boy. <laughs> Holy shit. That's fantastic. Nations wage war over limited resources available. Look at those Kangs killing the white devils. Oh, here we go. Oh, God. I, I'm sorry. I was hoping they'd have voice acting. I Apparently, they don't have voice acting. Take a look at that. Don't you want to teach children the truth about Kemet? Because that's what we're talking about. Kemet. Goals, $4,000, conquered. $10,000, conquered. $20,000, episode 3, or issue 3. For $30,000, you get 4 issues. $90,000, a 1-minute pilot pitch to Netflix. $150,000, 2-minute pilot pitch. Twice the impact. What is Kids to Kangs? Written by Manuel Gatto and uh, drawn by David Lenormand. Kids to Kangs is a story about a young boy named Asur whose life goal is to rule Kemet. The goal leads him on a jury, er, journey so far off lands in the ancient world where he deals with the complicated issues involving wars and ancient gods that seek his death. He's accompanied by his kinfolk, by his kinfolk, Seth, Oset, 
and Nebit as they travel the world getting woke. The world of Black Sands is so deep, and the original cultures of the time are all represented in the sci-fi fantasy retelling of ancient myths. What to expect? Demigods. Ancient aliens. Historically accurate cultures. Various myths. And a good time. Should we take a look at the characters? Would you like to... Oh, let's get woke. Okay, main characters. Asur. Fighting style. Martial arts. Magic. Powerful. Augmentation. Goals. Become a strong leader like his grandfather. Faults. Overambitious and prideful. Asur is the eldest of the children and heir to the throne in Kemet. He has trained directly with Ra, the pharaoh, and his grandfather for years. Now he must deal with the reality that his parents and his master have two very different expectations of him. He always believes in his brother and sisters. That's Nebit. Aset, who I'm just going to refer to as Autist, because that's uh, the name is just, yeah. <laughs> and apparently Michael Jackson's a part of the cast. I mean, we got Seth here. Fighting style. Intimidation. Magic, disease, sand manipulation. Goals, to teach his kin to uh, the merits of divine rule. Faults, undermines his friends and pessimistic. Seth was born with a rare skin condition and is generally weaker than the others. His whiteness actually physically makes him weak. That is, that is something. Over time, his powers emerged, which made people around him sick. Before he could learn to control it, stories went around that he himself was sickness. This left him an outsider, but his kin never lost hope in him. He believes Ra's rule cannot be questioned even though the decisions may not be liked by others, even himself. So basically, what do we have here? We got Gara, right? Your little sand, your sand jutsu shit there, fag, yeah? Uh, we got Asur, who looks like the last air... It's a black last airbender. Uh, and then, you know... Pfft, Nebit and Autist, the four of them. Tahuti, Tahuti, no fighting style. Tahuti just likes to chill. Marduk, magic is storms and creations. Unknown goals, tries too hard to not have his presence known. Marduk is the leader of the Anuki and masterminds many of the missions for the world's artifacts. His minions and agents travel the world, sowing corruption and chaos in order to acquire things in sacred locations. His fierce rivalry with Gilgamesh is postponed when he realizes a bunch of kids are spoiling his plans, and he shifts his attention to them to dissuade them from going any further. If they do not heed his warnings, or <laughs> warnings, war will surely follow. How much do you want to bet when he takes that helmet off? It's a white dude. <laughs> We've got. Okay, let's see what this. You see my skin condition. All of my people of Kemet hated me. They thought me cursed. They looked upon me as if I were disease. That anger, that idea of being cursed enraged me. <clears throat> I accidentally killed a man who scorned me when I was nine. I stab what is this? I stared at him so uh, viciously as he cursed at me. He didn't care of my royal birth. To him, I was nothing. He ac they've actually made a character that is considered physically he's the incarnation of sickness because he is part white that's some woke shit that's right we we are we are bringing the truth to the people you know i will say this uh the kickstarter is laid out really nice like if you you know this they put it together well if you've seen a lot of kickstarters they're usually shit but this has it broken up you can see everything it's got a nice little flow chart for donation amounts makes it all really clear pretty pretty straightforward let's see did they do a lot of updates let's see their updates yeah they started this when march what is it march 13th yeah fuck i mean they, they've done an update maybe every two days so uh, twelve thousand bucks we're gonna get woke spread the oh wait i backed up a little too much spread the word spread the word so we can watch kemet and the real history of the world. I want to see these people go on adventures. I want to see if Tahuti, an autist, can help everybody else on their quest to put the Neanderthal in his place. Yeah, smacks lips. Got to do that now. 
Uh, does this have a DeviantArt? I believe it does. I believe you can find uh, art of this on DeviantArt. I think you can find videos of it. Apparently the full, the full first episode is up on YouTube. So you can go watch that at your leisure. It's 18 minutes. It's a, a visual novel that's kind of animated. I, I don't know if it has any voice acting, but we can pray. We can pray that they get $90,000 to do a one-minute pitch to Netflix. Because that would be fantastic. Who wouldn't want to watch this? Ah, <laughs> oh, man. You've got to love the internet. You've just... Okay. Ah, uh, that... Yeah, I'm going to segue out of that. I'm going to segue out of We Was. If you want to look it up, again, it's on Kickstarter. It's Kids to Kings Comics. And, uh... <laughs> throw some money at him. Let's see if we can get him to 90000 to get that, that hot Netflix show we've all been waiting for. The Last Blackbender. That's what I'm going to call it. The Last Blackbender Wokeness Edition. Now, um, Shia LaBeouf, aside from going crazy and hiding, you know, flags from people screaming Pepe at him, uh, recently had a bit of a, a little bit of a tizzy fit at a bowling alley uh, where he, he, uh, well, you know, I'm just going to show you the video. There's actually two videos now, by the way. Uh, TMZ uploaded a second video, an extended video of Shia LaBeouf having a meltdown at a bowling alley. Why he's at a bowling alley, I don't know. But he's at a bowling alley having a fucking tism fit. So I'm going to throw that up, and you can take a look. I love how he, he actually screams out at them, You fucked up! You fucked up not serving me my french fries and hitting me with a grape juice bottle! Apparently everybody's racist. I don't know if they scream Pepe at him. I'm not sure what fucking sent him over the edge. But that's the second video. There's another video showing him running in and out of the bowling alley You know, after he screamed racist at everybody and left. Uh, he left with the bowling shoes on, so he had to run back inside after storming out. Take his little gay bowling shoes off, grab his normal sneakers, and then run out again angrily. You know, imagine throwing a tantrum, right? And you try to leave, and you try to be like, you know, you're slamming the door in anger, like, fuck everybody. I'm never coming back to this shithole. And then immediately you have to walk back in after making that giant fucking scene because you forgot your shoes. I, I love that people fuck with this guy everywhere. They wouldn't serve him french fries. A bowling alley wouldn't serve Shia LaBeouf french fries, and he screamed racist at them, and then he ran out of a bowling alley and took their shoes. What what a what the fuck is this guy's issue? He's having a mental breakdown. I, I just I love the you fucked up part. It's the way he says it is what I love the most about it. I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to put that back on for a second. Yeah, that's that's the one right there. I want that as like a ringtone. You fucked up. How dare you not serve me French fries? Don't you know I was in Transformers? I'm Shia LaButtfuck. 
He's actually, this whole fucking scene is because they won't serve his ass french fries. And every black guy at that bar is laughing their fucking ass off as this white retard, this little, this little fucking cuck is throwing a fit because the dude won't serve him french fries and he's flipping the fuck out. That is just, that is great. That is great. He went from a multi-millionaire, uh, world-famous actor who would get his dick sucked by, you know, all his little fangirls. And after about a fucking month worth of the internet making fun of him and ruining his gay art project, now nobody will serve him french fries at bowling alleys. How hard did you guys destroy this motherfucker? To go from world-class actor to throwing a fit in a bowling alley because a dude won't serve you french fries in the span of a fucking month. All because you stole his stupid little flag and ruined his gay art project. That is amazing. The internet is fucking amazing. Yeah, he's unhinged. If he does a part five, if he does a season five to He Will Not Divide Us, it is going to end so badly. I, I know people were saying he was going to be in a cuck shed somewhere in, like, I, I don't even know where the fuck it was, like Norway or something? That he was going to go do a one-month stream in the middle of a, sh uh, a shed in the middle of fucking nowhere. If he's dumb enough to do that, people are going to show up and screw with him. And I think he might finally break down. He's going to shoot somebody eventually. I really have that, that feeling that that's going to happen. He seems like a really pissed off, violent guy. And I don't think he's used to being fucked with. And now he's at the point where random fucking bartenders or uh, food servers at bowling alleys won't give him french fries. Like, he's going to lose his shit and start... He's going to go on a fucking killing spree. This is why Jaden Smith isn't allowed to hang out with him anymore. Will Smith told him, he's like, that guy is fucking crazy, Jaden. Just don't. Don't even... Just fuck it. Come to come with come with me and your mother. Let's go smoke a joint and listen to Scientology. You leave Shia LaBeouf alone. He's fucking insane. Scientologists are afraid of Shia LaBeouf. Some fucking Jaden Smith, a pothead Scientologist, has enough common sense to stay away from this fucker. That is how far he has fallen. That is amazing. Yeah, there's there's no French fries for Shia. He's he's getting no French fries. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna see if I can find the. There's a second video. It's it's not a lot longer, uh, but let me see if I can find it. Where he, it shows him running around with his little bowling shoes. I think it's actually on TMZ's page. Uh, give me one second here. Ah, can't get it. Uh, I had it earlier, but I can't find it now. Uh, what are you gonna do? But that's uh, that's Shia. It, it's only a matter of time. He can't he can't last much longer. Season five is gonna be suicide. That would be season five. That would be that would be season five. It's it just him looking into the camera, and you slowly see a gun come up from the left side of the frame, and that's it. That's the ending. The only thing that finally divided Shia was a hollow point bullet to the brain. He, that's that that's that is his performance art. It's really avant-garde. It's really out there. That's how he ends it. And he's just got a fistful of french fries. That's the symbolism. The deep deep symbolism of his message. Fistful of french fries, gunshot to the head. End of season 5. Yeah, yeah, chat. You uh, you drove him insane. That's the, it's fucking remarkable. I mean, you broke a celebrity. You have literally broken a man to the point where he's throwing tantrums in bowling alleys, and it took you a month. He's a fucking laughing stock. You've made this man a laughing stock around the world, and it took you one month to do it. I, you know, I I dare another celebrity to try a similar art project. I don't think it's gonna end well for them either. It kind of reminds me of how the internet used to be. It feels like people are, at this point, just fucking with him for the laughs, which is great. That's that's the way it should be. I love when it's, there's no purpose. It's just, it's random fucking chaos. Shia LaBeouf, like, just for, for whatever reason, you know, those first couple of uh, seasons 
when he was in um, New York and when he was in Albuquerque. A very specific group of people fucking with him. But I think as time went on, more and more people have been drawn to this, where I don't think there's anywhere in the world that he can really go to hide. I don't think he can move his little art project anywhere that's going to be safe. He's going to have to go to fucking Antarctica. Even then, I wouldn't put it past some autist from the internet to find a way to fuck with him. So well done. <laughs> well done <laughs> making this guy <laughs> have a fucking meltdown that uh, that never ends. Uh, let me see. Oh, I was going to talk about Mass Effect Andromeda, but... Whew. Uh, oh, yeah. See, this is why you should never pander uh, to a specific audience segment. Because you're never, it, it's never going to be good enough. Uh, Bioware apologizes for how it handled Mass Effect, Andromeda's transgender character. Uh, I have to read it for you to believe this, how fucking retarded this is. This, okay, of all the shit that you've heard about Mass Effect Andromeda, from the goddamn awful uh, facial animations to the shitty characters to the god-awful conversation, uh, just the storyline was shit. There, there were a lot of fucking issues with this game. This is what they uh, apologize for. Earlier this week, Bioware announced details about changes to Mass Effect Andromeda, including alterations to conversations with non-playable character Hanley Abrams. Now Bioware is apologizing specifically for not including Abrams, a transgender character, in a caring or thoughtful way in the game. Bioware published a statement today saying the studio is apologizing to anyone who interacted with or was hurt by this conversation and that Bioware is working to remedy the issue. This is their full statement. I, I still am fucking floored by the fact that they actually wrote this shit. At Bioware, we strive to make games that are representative of our players and the broader world around us. We do this by actively consulting within our diverse workforce, as well as speaking with different communities. And Mass Effect Andromeda, one of our non-playable characters, Hanley Abrams, was not included in a caring or thoughtful way. We apologize to anyone who interacted with or was hurt by this conversation. That was never our intent, and was an unfortunate byproduct of the iterative, iterative process of game design and a change in the structure of the character's dialogue. We have had several discussions with members of the transgender community, both internally, internally at BioWare, and in the broader community, and we are working to remedy the issue. Once the changes are implemented, Hanley will only reveal certain information to Ryder after they have developed trust, and only if the character chooses to support her. As always, we appreciate the help, feedback, and support from the Mass Effect community. That's what they apologize for. Abrams is an NPC player. Uh, uh, MC, I'm sorry. Abrams is an NPC players can meet along their journey in Andromeda, who reveals to Ryder her pre-transition name unprompted for that specific information. A trait some players have said does not accurately reflect the experience for all trans people, especially as she appears uncomfortable about her former name. And what do they link to? They link to fucking Polygon, of course. <laughs> Is that a jab at Polygon? They're talking, okay, uh, you know what, Abrams, okay, uh, her pre-transition name unprompted for that, a trait some players, and then it links to a Polygon article about Zelda. I, I don't, Fuck, I don't know. Is IGN making that might be a that might be a shot at uh, at Polygon there? So yeah, what what do we fix? What do we apologize for about our busted fucking video game with dead-eyed characters that look autistic and have terrible dialogue options and a shitty story and animation is just fucking horrendous? I know. Let's apologize because an NPC character nobody probably gives a fuck about said their dead name or whatever they call it uh, unprompted in a conversation. That that's that's it. That really is that that gets monogam jogging. That's the important thing. Are they gonna have trans DLC? I don't know. <laughs> maybe maybe yeah. Maybe we need to demand that Bioware makes a uh, trans DLC for Andromeda. I think that Hanley should have their own twenty hour, twenty hour side story, in which we fight to get that. Uh, to get that transition surgery. I think that's what we need. I think that's what Andromeda really needs. We need to watch Hanley's uh, beautiful journey from pre-op to post-op. 
I also like, I, I, I really love the part too. Uh, we've talked with members of the transgender community internally at BioWare. So if you have transgender people working internally at BioWare on this product, I'm assuming, uh, and they had no problem with it, then what was the issue to begin with? Who's complaining about this? Why is this a fucking issue? You've got other things to fix, and you're issuing apologies about this non-issue. Just amazing. BioWare is just a living fucking parody at this point. Just just a living fucking parody. Oh, okay. All right. Polygon, Zelda, Mass Effect, and Horizon all struggle with introducing their trans characters. It could have gone better. This is an article from last month. There was a trans character in Horizon Zero Dawn. I guess I didn't play far enough into it to find that. Apparently, yes, there is. Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild contains four quest lines that are required to get the game's best ending. One of these quest markers leads to Gerudo Town. It is an all-female city. Okay, where's the... let's see. You will repeatedly be refused entry by two guards outside the city after being told that Voi men are forbidden from this all-vi women city before learning that a man has been using deception to sneak in and out of the city. Your attempts to figure out what's going on lead to Hylian women... Okay. I, is this fucking for real? Is Polygon really writing an article about this? course they are jesus christ what do these games teach us gaming is trying to address the audience more thoughtfully and that includes trans representation but it seems like few teams know how to do this well even though the solution isn't complicated fuck me so polygon's complaint is zelda didn't handle transsexuality well enough in breath of the wild the <laughs> And BioWare is now apologizing because Polygon also said that uh, Mass Effect Andromeda didn't handle it well enough either for their NPC conversation nobody gives a shit about. That's, that's brilliant. It's great. Good stuff. Man, I remember when fucking video games was about little blue hedgehogs collecting rings and fat plumbers stomping on turtles. And now everything is so fucking political and so sexual and so all of this shit. I just, I miss my video games. I'm sick of overpaying, I'm sick of paying $50 for a fucking re-release of a game that doesn't have anything added to it. With the only, I guess, the only addition actually being DRM. I'm sick of all the fucking political shoehorning shit into video games. I just, I... Uh... I guess I'm going to have to stick to emulation. I'm going to have to just play retro video games from now on. <laughs> Zelda has a cross-dresser. Well, Final Fantasy had Cloud dress up like a woman, too. I mean, I, I don't... Could, I, fuck, can you imagine how that scene's going to be handled in the uh, remake? I, I, can already re, I can already hear the Polygon articles now. I can already hear the outcry because no matter what they do with that particular scene, there's going to be an issue. Something's just not going to be good enough. It's not going to be right enough. There's going to need to be an apology. Just unreal. I'm telling you, apologizing doesn't work. Neither does pandering. Pandering does not work. Fuck, look at Marvel. I mean, their VP of, what was it, sales came out recently and said all the diversity shit is backfired and it hasn't really done well for the company. And was it just a year ago they were calling for the heads of people at Marvel because they didn't like their political orientation and they thought they were anti-diversity? The world's gone fucking insane. <laughs> you sexually identify... Somebody in chat. I, you sexually identify as transphobic. That's a new one. I, I wonder how they would get around that. You've got to respect that gender identity. And that gender identity is being transphobic. So, I mean, come on. It is the current year. Uh, yeah, I'm actually, I want to play Nier. Uh, the only problem is, I know that it has some issues on the PC, and I'm waiting for that to be addressed in a patch. I, I know there are workarounds for the resolution and a few of the other issues. Uh, once that's officially addressed, I'm going to probably pick it up, because it looks like it's a really good game. Also, your uh, Persona 5 is supposed to be really good. So, I, I, there are a couple games out there.
Uh, Breath of the Wild is running on an emulator. I played, or I played Breath of the Wild. I got the Wii U version. Because I actually was dumb enough to buy a fucking Wii U. And I've had it sitting there for... <laughs> since fucking launch. And what have I played on it? Xenoblade, or Xenoblade Chronicles X. And, um... And Zelda. So two games? Two games. That was a fucking great investment. I, I better go out and get a Switch. There might be two more games released in the next five years by Nintendo that I actually might want to play. That's a good investment. You're sure. And my PS4 is sitting right next to it in a pile of dust. Because you can only play Bloodborne 500 times before you want to shoot yourself. And then after that, what do you have? So hopefully Persona is as good as they say it is, because that would be, that would be something after forever uh, since fucking Bloodborne. Okay. Well, like I said, I just wanted to do a little stream, talk about a few things, mainly the political stuff. Like I said, it, it, the situation with Bannon in the White House is the one that interests me the most because I, I think it could be a good indicator of things that might be coming. Now, maybe it's true uh, what they're saying and that he really was just on the council to babysit some people and to help Trump, I guess, rearrange and maybe he did get his goal accomplished and he's done and he's stepping aside but he's still holding on to his advisory role fine but I think if we see more things happen with Bannon in the White House I think if his power is even more diminished or if he resigns or if he's fired or if he gets shuffled somewhere else then I think that is not a uh, not a positive sign for the way things are going I hope we don't go into Syria I think it's a fucking mistake I think every time we get involved and we try to take out despots, as we claim, it just ends up being a shit show. And it doesn't turn out good for the country we go into, and it doesn't turn out well for us. Because we lose money, and we lose men, and then they lose, basically, central leadership, and then everything devolves into a shit show. And it's just a... It's a fucking disaster. I really, really hope we don't go in. Um, yeah, so positive stuff, huh? Looking good. Looking good, you know. Gotta get those. Uh, gotta. Get... <laughs> uh, I, you know, I really do hope if we get any leaks in the next two or three weeks or a month, that somebody has audio tape of Bannon calling Kushner a cuck. That would be fucking amazing, if that's legitimate. Or maybe you know, I'd rate equally as high as that if somebody could get film of a radioactive Roger Stone flying through the air powered by polonium. That would be pretty fucking amazing too. So, Bannon calling people cucks or a polonium-infused uh, radioactive Roger Stone flying through the air. One of those two things would really, really make this month spectacular. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it short. That's, uh, that's all the stream I got in me today. Those are the, the subjects I wanted to talk about. You know, it's getting, I got, I'm getting really tired. I think we should all just take a nap now. Let our almonds rest from all the activation. Stop, you know, stop jogging that noggin. Get a little shut-eye. That's, uh, that's the way to go. I will uh, leave the stream up. I usually don't do that, but I promised I would with this one. Uh, just for future notice, too, in case anybody wants to watch streams kind of going forward, I'll put them up, uh, I'll put up advance notice in, like, you know, a uh, day's worth advance notice. But I'm going to be streaming on another channel, uh, Brightside Bob, because then I can play clips and music and all that other shit uh, more freely. And I also don't give a shit if the stream is left up, because who cares? Uh, it doesn't doesn't clutter anything. It's a shit-posting channel. Well, you have a, uh, a good a good week chat. Enjoy your Thursday. Hopefully World War III doesn't hit us and we all end up exploding and dying. That would be nice, but you know, fingers crossed it turns out well. And uh, keep, keep your eyes on the sky. You might see Roger Stone flying by. And that's something you can tell the grandkids about. That's a, that's a special fucking thing. 